I know a couple of you, because I've spoken with a couple of you about uh, a film that's called Seven Days in Utopia. Has anybody, uh, I know Lance and Dory have seen it. Has anybody seen that? I would highly, highly recommend it. It is a completely family film, totally, 100%. Um, Seven Days in Utopia. The film is about a young professional golfer named Luke Chisholm. And he is on the verge of winning this major tournament. And uh, in the last hole, he has a complete meltdown. He begins breaking his gloves and throwing them into the pond on the golf course and so on. And he becomes so humiliated that his father, who is his coach and caddy, just leaves him. So Luke throws the remaining clubs into the trunk of his car and he drives away and he doesn't really know where he's going. He just leaves. But he's on this country back road and he comes to this T intersection. And here he has to make a choice. Do I go left? Do I go right? So he goes right. But he's so frustrated at his meltdown that he neglects to see in the middle of the road there is a huge bull standing there. So he swerves to miss the bull and he drives off the road and he lands in a ditch in the small town of Utopia, Texas. And there really is a town. Texas got a town named for everything, but anyway, <laughs> Utopia is this town in Texas. And by the way, I'll have the privilege of going there next month. I'm going on a trip and Utopia will be one of the spots. And it's while his car is being repaired that he's be befriended by this retired professional golfer who knows who Luke is because he's seen him play. And this former professional golfer was forced to come to terms with his own destructive behavior, but now he's turned his life around, but not before it cost him his wife and his career as a professional golfer. But using biblical principles for guidance, the retired golfer teaches Luke the true meaning of life. Now, this is not a story about golf so much. The story is about confronting one's own actions and taking ownership for what we do, learning from our mistakes and how to go forward in a positive way. This morning, we're going to look at the life of David and what made him such a great king. Not only in the eyes of the Israelites, but as the Bible calls him twice, a, God after, a, a man after God's own heart. Now, a lot of Christians ask the question, why do I need to know all this stuff about these Old Testament characters? And what do they have to do with Jesus? Imagine opening a book, right in the middle of the book, and here are all these people that the author has mentioned, and you don't have a clue who they are. That's why we study the Old Testament. So we'll know who these people are. And one reason Jesus is so prominent in the book that was written before his earthly life is that the Old Testament was designed to bring us to Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote, Therefore the law was a tutor to bring us to Christ that we may be justified by faith. Galatians 3.24 Think of how many times Jesus said, It is written. Have you not read? These were references to the Old Testament because we did not have the New Testament, nor did the disciples of the first century. How many times did the apostles refer to the Old Testament? Countless times. How many times do we read about the prophecies in the Old Testament that refer explicitly to Jesus? Hundreds of times. This is why God gave us the history of his people, so that we can learn from them whether good or bad. And this brings us to King David. David is a fascinating character. I learned so much studying about his life. Make no mistake, he was by no means perfect. He had many serious flaws. And we need to realize that even Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and even Moses, as great as they were, they all had their faults but that didn't stop them from striving to serve God to the best of their human ability. Even with their faults, these men are considered heroes of the Bible. And God concluded them in the history of his people 
not only for us to learn from their mistakes, but more importantly, to remind us that God is forgiving if we truly seek him. Hebrews 11, 6 says that God rewards those who seek him. As I was researching David's life, I was reminded what the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 17, verses 14 through 20. For I do not understand what I am doing, for I am not practicing what I want to do, but the very thing that I hate. Paul's not making an excuse for his sins. Paul is addressing the conflict that we all face, the conflict between our carnal nature and the spiritual desire to do what is right in God's eyes. Paul, like David, recognizes that he, is, he alone is responsible for his actions, for his sins. And this is exactly what David faced throughout his life. Just because David was king does not mean that he didn't have sins or that they magically disappeared. If anything, they were magnified. Everyone who knows the Bible understands that King David was a great man. And yet, everyone familiar with the Bible also recognizes that David did a lot of not-so-great things. If I were to ask members of this audience this morning, what is David most remembered for, your answers would vary. However, my guess would be that most of you would say his sin with Bathsheba, the murder of her husband Uriah, and the subsequent cover-up perhaps killing of Goliath. But that's not exactly delighting in the law of the Lord as David wrote in Psalms chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Blessed is the person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the paths of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law he meditates on day and night. On numerous occasions, David was David allowed his pride, his pride to overcome his better judgment, which angered God, 1 Samuel 24.10, and we'll look at this more in a moment. We also see that David was, using today's language, the poster boy for how not to manage your household well. David's household was dysfunctional, to say the least. One of his sons, Amnon, raped his half-sister Tamar, which prompted their brother Absalom to kill Amnon. And it's interesting that two of David's sons tried to usurp his position as king, Absalom being one, because David did nothing about the rape of his sister by their brother Amnon. For being a man after God's own heart, David managed to follow his own heart quite a bit. So with all these flaws, what made great David so great? One could easily mention David's courage, his loyalty, his faith, his success as a leader, musician, and warrior. But he was great in other lesser known areas as well. In particular, David was great a great man because he was willing to overlook and forgive the sins of others but he was unwilling to overlook his own sins. David was a gracious man, bearing with the failings of others and eager to forgive and give his enemies a second chance. Twice while his friends asked him and advised him to strike down their enemy, King Saul, David spared King Saul's life. First Samuel chapter 24 and 26. See, David revered the fact that Saul was God's anointed, and even though Saul sought his life, David refused to kill him because he was God's anointed. <clears throat> David loved God so much that after he learned of Saul's death, he mourned Saul. And here's an interesting aspect to the death of Saul. How many in here know that Saul actually tried to kill himself? Saul actually tried to commit suicide. It was during a battle with the Philistines as they were closing in on King Saul, and because he didn't want to be captured, for obvious reasons, he attempted suicide. But he was unsuccessful. So he asked a young man to, please stand next to me and finish me off, for agony has seized me, because my life still lingers in me. 2 Samuel 2, 9. When this young man reports the news to David, 
His reaction shows the deep respect that David had for God's anointed one. And David said to him, How is it that you were not afraid to reach out your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Then David called one of the young men and said, Come forward, put him to death. So he struck him and he died. And David said to him, Your blood is on your head because your own mouth has testified against you, saying, I have finished off the Lord's anointed. 2 Samuel 1, 14. Now let's not forget that Saul sought to kill David out of envy because David was considered a greater man than King Saul. Though Saul opposed him at every turn, David did not rejoice in his death, but he wept for the king and his son, Jonathan. 2 Samuel 11, I'm sorry, 2 Samuel 1, 17. David was anointed to be the next king because God rejected Saul's disobedience. The people of Judah followed David, and the people of Israel followed King Saul. So we actually have a divided kingdom at this point. And here we have this political power play, David against the house of Saul. There are two individuals that are integral into this aspect of the life of David, Abner and Ishbosheth. Abner was Saul's military commander. And after Jonathan, Saul's oldest son, was killed by the Philistines, Ishbosheth became Saul's oldest son and the heir apparent to becoming king of Israel. But remember, Ishbosheth was never anointed. David was and Saul was. But after Saul's death, the people of Judah continued to follow David, and Israel followed Ishbosheth. After Ishbosheth was murdered by a loyalist of David, Abner, Saul's military commander, defected to David, and David welcomed him. It didn't matter that he was a former opponent, a former political rival. rival. David welcomed him as a fellow Israelite. David didn't hold grudges. Later, Abner sought to make a covenant with David to install him as the king of Israel. But he was murdered by Joab, David's military commander, because Joab distrusted Abner's intention in seeking a covenant with David to install him him as king of Israel. Some people say that the Old Testament is boring, but this story about David, you know, Hollywood has tried to make films about it, but they always have to throw in the Hollywood stuff. If they would just stick to the facts that God has given us, this story has it all. It's got it all. I, I mean, it really does, and I would encourage you, if you're interested, go back and read 2 Samuel and 1 Kings about David. It's just a fascinating, fascinating story. But the point here is that David mourned the death of Abner and Ishbosheth, 2 Samuel chapter 3. David didn't find joy in the death of his enemies or his political rivals. David was kind to Mahetboseth, Jonathan's crippled son. Jonathan, remember, was David's closest friend and King Saul's oldest son. David took pity on the crippled Mahetboseth and allowed him to live a comfortable life, even providing for him. And David was uncommonly patient. Four. David was uncommonly patient with a man from the house of Saul named Simeon, when he spitefully and bitterly cursed David. David could have put him to death, but he didn't. David was forgiving. And later, David would pardon those who rebelled against him during Absalom, his oldest son's insurrection. Time after time, David showed himself to be unlike the sons of Zeruiah, who lived to hold grudges and settle scores with people. These people were mean-spirited and hateful. But this was not David's personality. David knew how to forgive. More than anyone prior to Jesus, David loved his enemies. Like no other Testament king, David was willing to overlook the sins of those who had opposed him. As God's anointed shepherd, David would welcome the prodigal sons, if you will, of Israel 
back to the flock. But amazingly, David's kind-hearted attitude towards his enemies did not translate to a soft attitude towards his own sins. Usually, people who are soft with others are soft with themselves by trying to justify their actions. And those hardest on themselves are even harder on others. But David was different. He was gracious with others and honest with himself. And I believe David's, greatest, David's greatness was simply this. As much as he sinned, he never failed to own up to his sins. And he repented for them. And there is the lesson that God wants for all of us to learn from David's life. Repentance, forgiveness, and repentance. And not allow grudges and hatred to consume our life. David was rightly rebuked for his failings, but he never failed to heed the rebuke. When Nathan confronted David for his adultery and murder, he quickly lamented, I have sinned against the Lord, 2 Samuel 12, 13. When Joab, his military commander, rebuked David for loving his <coughs> treacherous sons more than his own loyal subjects, David did what Joab told him to do, and he repented. Joab was often wrong in his advice to David, but when he was right, David saw it and changed course. Likewise, after his foolish sense, in which his pride got the better of him, David's heart struck him and he confessed, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. 1 Samuel 24.10 This is what I alluded to earlier when God was angry with David. God was angry that David took pride in his large, powerful army rather than relying on God for his victories. But David repented of his prideful sin. See, David knew how to forgive, and he did know how to repent. And he never blamed others for his mistakes. He did not make excuses based on family history, peer pressure, or the demands of leadership. How many of us sort of just dismiss our sins and never give them a second thought? No harm, no foul, as the saying goes. Former Congressman J.C. Watts of Oklahoma once said, character is doing the right thing when no one is looking. And it's easy for us to do something wrong and just forget about it. But God still remembers it. And it's the character within us and the character that we see with David that when he did something, he owned up to it and made it right. David did not lament over his sins simply because of the negative effects they could have on his kingdom or his relationship. He saw his transgressions primarily looking upward as an offense against Almighty God. After his affair with Bathsheba became known and the death of his son from that relationship, David wrote Psalm 51. Excuse me. Listen to how contrite and remorseful he is. Gracious, be gracious to me, Yahweh, according to your faithfulness, according to your greatness, your compassion. Wipe out my wrongdoings. Wash me thoroughly from my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my wrongdoings and my sin is constantly before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Psalm 51, verse 1 through 4. And I want to read a couple of passages from that again. Be gracious to me, Yahweh. Wipe out my wrongdoings. Wash me thoroughly from my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. That sounds to me like someone who is deeply sorrowful for what he has done. See, David never ran from the light when it exposed his darkness. Instead, he admitted his iniquity and worked to make it right. 
When we consider how rare it is in our day for athletes, movie stars, celebrities, and even TV evangelists or ordinary folk, yes, I know how hard it is to believe that even politicians to candid candidly and clearly take re responsibility for their own sins, we should be all the more amazed that the King of Israel humbled enough to listen to the chastisement of those who were beneath him and change accordingly. David was also one of those few kings, rare kings in Israel history, who did not fall into the trap of worshiping false gods. Even his son Solomon fell into that trap. David was indeed a man after God's own heart because he hated sin, but he loved to forgive it. And what better example of God could there be. God hates sin, but he loves to forgive sinners. David had a truly repentant heart. Repent or repentance is a constant theme throughout the entire Bible. In fact, and depending on your translation, repent or repentance is referred to 108 times in the Old Testament alone and 66 times in the New Testament for about 174 times throughout Scripture. In the Old Testament Hebrew, repent is translated as regret, be moved to pity, comfort, or to have compassion. And that is exactly what David is asking for from God, for pity, to be comforted, or to be shown compassion. See, God just doesn't welcome, welcome in his enemies as David did. God died in our place. The Apostle Paul wrote, but God demonstrates his own love to us like this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. God is always eager to show mercy, always willing to forgive those who err and give them a second chance. And yet God is not soft on sin. He exposes it and calls on us to exterminate it, to remove it from our life. Colossians 3, 5 through 10. But of course, Jesus, unlike David, was never guilty of sin. 1 Peter 2, 22, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, and Hebrews 4, 15, among other verses, attest to Jesus being sinless. Jesus showed this not by humbling himself before a needed rebuke, but by humbling himself to take on human flesh and take up a cross. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. David was great, but not nearly as great as his future grandson, Jesus. If we learn anything from David's life, is that God loves a repentant person one who is truly willing to admit their sins and to repent with a godly sorrow. The church in Corinth had a lot of issues that the Apostle Paul had to address. And unlike us, some of the Christians in Corinth became upset or had their feelings hurt when their sins were pointed out to them. Brandy, would you put that slide up, please? In Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth, he wrote, For though I have caused you sorrow by my letter, I did not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I see that the letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. I now rejoice that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but to the sorrow of the world produces death. 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 11. For all his faults, this was David's attitude towards his sins, and it should be our attitude as well, that we're sorrowful. I have a very good friend of mine Matter of fact, I'll be seeing him next month and he'll be going to Utopia with me. I've known him for 50 years. 
He is a minister, and oftentimes during our phone conversations, he lives in Texas during our conversations, we will talk about biblical issues, and he's very, very knowledgeable. And we were talking about David and his life and so on, and he made this comment to me, so I'm giving him attribution. He said, if David was an adulterer and a murderer, and he was a man after God's own heart, that's good news for us. And I thought for a moment, good news for us? Yeah, because God accepted David, godly repentance, and restored him. And God is willing to restore us if we're willing to repent. And I'd like to close with this. As best you can, have your minds transported back 2,000 years. The church has just been established. Jesus has ascended. It's the day of Pentecost. We find this recorded in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 38. Thousands of Jews are assembled to hear what they believe is going to be called, going to be the law read to them, which was the custom on Pentecost to have the law read for remembrance of God, what had intended them to do. But Peter stands up. And beginning in verse 36 of chapter 2, Peter says, Let all those of the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to their hearts. Now some translations say pierced to their hearts is they were convicted in their conscience. They had just heard what Peter said, and they are convicted in their conscience of what they had done. They're moved by what he said. And they said Peter to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Which tells us that they knew that they needed to do something to make that situation right. In verse 38, Peter said to them, repent. Now notice, he said, repent. The very first thing Peter told them to do was to do what? To repent. Turn away from your sins. Turn away and lead the life that God has called you to lead. And let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So here's the question that I will leave you with today. With all of David's faults, why did God choose him to lead his people? And I think the Apostle Paul answers that in Acts chapter 13, verse 22, when he said, After he, God, had removed him, that would be King Saul, he raised up David to be their king. Concerning he, God, also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do, do what, God? What will David do? He will complete all I will. David will do all that I ask of him. So that leads us here. If there's anybody in the audience today who would like to do God's will, who has yet to be baptized for the remission of their sins, to be added to the body of Christ, we have a baptistry ready and we can accommodate you. If you happen to be watching at home, find yourself in this condition like David was, but that you realize that you need to have Christ, that you need to be baptized for those sins that need to be forgiven. You can contact us. We'll help you. We'll talk to you. We'll show you what really you need to do. We can take that further. Dave is going to lead us in an invitation song. If you'd like anything that we can do for you, please come forward as Dave leads us in this song.